Yeah. So um, based on all that we have said right now, the whole classroom technology development and all that is ushering us into our next section, which is um, about this whole technology, internet, broadband, how we can access it in the classroom. And yet to speak on it is um, Tobekele Matinde, who is representing Mr. Brenda Shetso of Paradigm Initiative. So Tobekele, I hope I'm getting that name right. Please, <laughs> please, you can come in and um, take up your section. Thank you very much. Hello, are you there? I am there. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much. So, um, like I said, I said you'll be taking up the section on um, broadband access to the classroom. So you can go ahead. Give us a little introduction of yourself and carry us through the journey of broadband access in our classroom. Thank you. That's all right. You're welcome. My name is Tobeki Lematimbe. I'm a community manager at Paradigm Initiative. And um, I am tuning in from Zimbabwe. Um, I'm happy to be on this platform where we're discussing um, digital citizenship. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes, we can. All right, great. Yeah. And can you see my screen? Yes. yes. All right, awesome. Yes. So um, I'm very honored to be part of this panel and to, to just follow through the conversations that we've been engaging in. And today, um, as you already mentioned, I'm, I'm here from Paradigm Initiative. And I think on the program, it was indicating that it was going to be Benga Sassan, but um, he's not able to be here. But I'm going to be discussing achieving broadband access in the classroom. So I think we've had a good, robust conversation around what happens um, in schools and how we can, we can have capacity for, um, for teachers, for educators within our schools. And we've also had a briefing on what digital citizenship is all about. But obviously, there's something that allows um, you know, everyone to be connected and be part of you know, the global um, network or the global society, which is the world that we are living in. And that is internet access. And hence, we are discussing um, the importance of broadband and how it plays a good and important role in ensuring that everyone has um, access to you know, what we are discussing, digital citizenship. So I'm going to, you know, get right into it and just, you know, start with uh, an interesting quotation uh, from uh, George Kuros, which says, technology will not replace great teachers, but technology in the hands of great teachers can be transformational. Technology in the hands of great teachers is going to be able to transform the world, transform the face of education, especially when we're looking at the African continent. Now, when we're looking at the African continent within which we are operating in, you'd find that um, the challenge that we're having is that there's a big digital divide that we find. And you find that now, more so during the COVID-19 pandemic, you'd find that a lot of things have been happening. And you'd find that a lot of communities have been marginalized or left behind when we're looking at the very important aspect or issue or human rights, which is called um, education and access to information. Those are very critical human rights issues. I'm going to just begin as well by just highlighting something uh, that was raised, you know, um, under the digital transformation of education, connecting schools, empowering learners, a broadband commission for sustainable developments, working group on school connectivity report, um, which states that in today's increasingly digital world, 3.6 billion people still have no access to the internet and those without access are typically the most vulnerable minorities, people with disabilities, indigenous. May I ask those who have, them, um, we, we have unmuted um, themselves to be able to mute themselves so that we are able to have a good discussion on broadband issues. So those without access are typically the most vulnerable, like I've already mentioned, the minorities, people with disabilities, indigenous and marginalized groups, as well as women, children, and youth from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds or living in areas affected by conflict and violence. So what are the impacts of this? Lack of internet access reduces paths to a world of information available online, and it limits the potential to learn and to grow, all of which contribute to the digital divide. If we are to succeed, 
to learn and grow, all, sorry, if we are to succeed in leaving no one behind, it is essential as established in the United Nations 2030 agenda that, that we need to ensure that we're working to provide everyone, especially children and young people with safe and secure access to the internet, not to mention the digital skills they need to learn and improve their lives. So you'd find that within the classrooms themselves, there's need for connectivity, there's need for access to broadband, there's need for data connectivity so that our children, our students, our learners, they're able to be connected to the broader world around them, as well as the teachers themselves, they are capacitated with what they need in terms of the relevant skills to be able to deliver quality education in line with sustainable development goal number four. So it's very critical that we actually um, have this. But why are we saying we want access to the internet to be able to achieve um, quality education within the classroom? It stems basically from the basic, from the basic, you know, start or basic um, human rights issues that we can actually highlight. Sorry, Anthony, please can you um, mute yourself? So it starts from the, you know, from the basis of human rights. What are human rights? Human rights are what everybody else should be able to access and to be able to enjoy. So you'd find that when we're looking at um, human rights issues. Um, there shouldn't be frontiers, there shouldn't be barriers to say, okay, the rich get more, you know, human rights, so to speak, and those who are in the minorities get little. So you'd find that even during COVID-19, schools have been running and you'd find that there's been online virtual learning that's been happening. But for most of the elite communities and those who are able to actually be in private schools that they can access, um, you know, broadband and also access, you know, the digital tools that they need to actually be connected. And that naturally has brought the digital divide that I was highlighting. So basic human rights, these are, this are, this are your, you know, the, your rights that you are used to, your freedom of expression itself. You'd find that learners need to be on platforms to be digital citizens. They need to be connected, to be able to be connected globally and to be able to access the internet, to access opportunities for growth. So all children must have access to high quality education. This you can find it when you're referring to Article 28 and 29 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. So basically it is important for children to access that education. Connectivity and access themselves to information can pave the way to provide other essential services, such as your health care and, you know, um, Children can also be able to. This, I mean, children can also be able to be. I mean, to be exposed to what's happening in the world and be able to to develop themselves and even to aim higher and to have you know aspirations for professions that they will probably discover when they are exposed to online platforms. So human rights are not abstract. They are not features that we discuss, um, you know, in a research proposal or something that remains in a book somewhere. They are inherent because we are human beings and children. And even you know the educators, they also have that right to actually access, um, you know, the tools that they need to be able to enjoy the fullness of life. So there's need for education, there's need for health, there's need for development, which translates to enjoyment of the rights to life. And that starts within the classroom. When we are looking at development, we are saying when a child is in the classroom, they should be able to access internet platforms so that they they enhance um, the quality you know, of their education, they enhance um, the quality, you know, of their learnings. And this naturally capacitates them to be able to access greater opportunities in their lives. So broadband, well, you might be wondering what is broadband? Um, but broadband simply, you know, without stressing much or complicating the term, it really is looking at aspects of the network and services, including the infrastructure used to deliver services to users, as well as the speed of accessing the internet and the type of services and applications that can be accessed via the internet. And in some countries such as Brazil and international organizations such as the OECD, these have chosen not to categorize broadband in terms of speed, but are instead defining broadband in terms of functionality, focusing on what can and cannot be done with a certain type of connection. So basically what we are saying is that they should be just, you know, connection, connectivity that allows, um, you know, anyone to be on an online platform. So how can we ensure that we have, um, you know, good broadband or, you know, before we even get there, 
let's look at what the problem is with actually not having that access to broadband. You find that when we don't have that access to broadband, what we are having is you know, an increase in inequalities within our societies. So we need to be able to bridge the digital divide. The COVID-19 pandemic itself has exposed the insufficient digital infrastructure in our African economies and unearthed the, in the inequalities existing within our societies. So you find that as I've already highlighted, you've got marginalized societies that have been left behind in 2020, never mind other years before, while those with the means of accessing data were able to find themselves in the classroom within the confines of their homes. So you find that a lot of people are discussing about the new normal and which new normal says that people should be found on online platforms. That's our, our new normal. Right now I'm calling in, but I'm within my home and I'm communicating with you because I'm connected because I've got access to broadband. But I know that there are some rural communities that are left behind that do not have that access. When we're looking at our communities, you can imagine um, how that leaves them behind. And this is what we are saying today to say when we're looking at achieving broadband within the classroom, what we are saying is we're calling for connectivity that ensures that the teachers themselves, the educators are able to deliver quality education while the students themselves are able to learn beyond their jurisdiction and be able to be digital citizens. So according to the United Nations policy brief on the impact of COVID-19 on children, 188 countries had imposed countrywide closures affecting more than 1.5 billion children and youth by 15 April 2020. Countries had imposed countrywide school closures, sorry, affecting more than 1.5 billion children and youth, and more than two thirds of countries introduced a national distance learning platform. But among low income countries, the share is only 30%. Before the crisis, almost one third of the world's young people were already digitally excluded. That should tell you something about why it is important that more than ever, you know, we become advocates, even as educators, for, you know, connectivity for broadband so that within the classroom setup we are able to deliver our education and be able to bridge the digital gap so that our inequalities which were already there in existence before the pandemic hit they are not worsened but that we actually find a way of bridging of bridging that so you can look at various you know frameworks that provide for access to information as a very priority is a very important human rights issue that look at freedom of expression is a very critical human rights issue and that also look at education as a very important human rights issue so you'd look at your African charter on human and people's rights you can also look at your ICSCR that's your international Convent, covenant on economic social social and cultural rights then we look at the African Commission, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights just released um, in, you know, in 2019, the Declaration of Freedom of Expression and Access to Information. And under Principle 8 there, it does speak that evolving capacities of children, states shall recognize and respect the evolving capacities of children and take measures that enable children, including adolescents, to exercise the right to freedom of expression and access to information. In all such actions, the best interest of the child shall be a primary consideration. And obviously, when we're talking about freedom of expression and access to information, we're actually basically talking about how children can be connected as well. It's not only for people we know as media practitioners who want to express themselves or ourselves as adults, but even children, they need to access information for them to be able to learn. When you're looking at your sciences, you know, your mathematics, your, you know, your, your science, uh, technology um, subjects within our classrooms, you'd find that it's pertinent that children access relevant information, which is accessible on online platforms. I'm going to give you an example of how it plays out. When you look at uh, mobile mathematics, um, in 2008, Nokia and the Department of Science and Technology launched what was called the mobile math service to South African high school math learners in grade 10 to 12. And such partnerships to ensure access facilitate quality education. So the service itself had many advantages in the formal learning situation as the service had mathematics content for grades 10, 11, and 12. And it includes thousands of exercises, theory, peer-to-peer -peer support, ranking competitions, tests, and self-assessments. So you find that for all this, MTN, which is um, you know, the telecoms company and Celsi. Um, you know, managed to reach out to its data users and the service had no data connection costs. 
So you find that there was this collaboration or multi-stakeholder intervention that was able to actually ensure that um, children were able to access education and to increase, you know, access to online platforms through uh, not even just a redu reduced uh, data cost, but also um, ensuring that uh, there was no data connection cost that came with it. So um, as I draw closer to the end of my presentation, I'll just refer you as well to uh, you know, a, a recent um, draft general comment by the United Nations uh, Committee on the Rights of Children, which talks about uh, children's rights in relation to the digital environment. Um, this um, critical draft comment refers to you know, key principles that should be adhered to, and one of them is the right to non-discrimination. So you find that um, it proposes in response to Article 2 of that convention, the right to non-discrimination, which requires that states ensure all children, including children of lower income um, families and children living in rural and remote areas to have equal and effective access to, digital, to the digital environment in ways that are actually meaningful for them. So you find that um, this has been shifted as well to say the states should be able to take all necessary measures to lower the cost of connectivity and to provide free access to children in safe, dedicated public spaces and invest in policies and programs that support that all children's use of digital technologies is you know, accessed at school, at home, and in their community so that they overcome inequalities and that um, you know, digital inclusion is improved. So it is very critical. So you might be wondering to say then what, so how do we achieve this? I have given you an example of, you know, mobile mathematics, you know, that, that, that platform, which was, you know, provided by a number of stakeholders and, um, you know, telecommunications companies like your know, MTN and, you know, Selfie, they came forward and said, okay, for our data users, we are going to be able to ensure that um, children from, you know, who are aged um, and who are in grade 10, 11 and 12 are able to access at, um, you know, no data, Cost for that. If um, I mean, that was amazing. So the thing is, what are we saying about that example? What we're saying is that in that example, you find that it was not only the responsibility of one person, but it was a multi-stakeholder approach where, you know, the government and telecommunications companies also came on board to also facilitate education. So educators as well were part of the conversation. So as part of solutions um, to achieving, you know, um, broadband within our classrooms. Uh, the recommendation that I'm making uh, is that we have, you know, a multi, multi sectoral and multi stakeholder approach to engage and ensure that we're able to, um, you know, advocate for accessible data and um, to be able to propose and recommend to our governments as well to be able to ensure that connectivity is distributed to all ends of, um, of our communities so that no one is left behind. And that will be my last slide, which says we need technology in every classroom and in every student and teacher's hand, because it is the pen and the paper of our time, and it is the lens through which we experience much of our world. Thank you very much. So much. Thank you so much, Mekele, for that. Thank you very much. We, we don't have much time now, but every question, any question should just be um, sent through the comment chat and we'll add